it's really wild what just a few hours can make in terms of how you respond to a specific kind of fast. There's an interesting study that took a look at what is called early time restricted feeding compared to, get this, midday time restricted feeding. We're talking nuancy level stuff here, right? We're talking the difference of a few hours. Early time restricted feeding, wrapping up your eating by like 1, 2 p.m. Midday time restricted feeding, at wrapping up your eating by say like, you know, 4, 5 p.m. But that difference of a few hours seems to be huge when it comes down to various metabolic markers. We're looking at things like HOMA IR, like markers of insulin resistance. Anyway, we're gonna get into it because this study was wild. So this study was published in the journal Nature in 2022, so it's relatively new, okay? And what it took a look at was early time restricted feeding. It was 82 participants, so 28 did uh, early time restricted feeding, 26 did midday time restricted feeding, and 28 did a control, okay? They just did a control diet. It, for five weeks, they had them go through this, and in five weeks, they saw a quite dramatic result. The early time restricted feeding group saw an increase in insulin sensitivity. They saw a decrease in adipose tissue, a decrease in glucose levels overall over a 24-hour period. They saw a decrease in inflammation, and get this, they saw an increase in gut microbiome diversity, okay? This is just between ETRF and MTRF just by a few hours. And I'm gonna get into the nuancy stuff of it as to why that happens, but the long and the short of it is it comes down to our circadian clock genes. So when you look at things and you see, okay, yeah, there's improvements in metabolic markers, there could be a direct effect, but there's always an indirect cascading effect of something, right? So perhaps one of the reasons early time restricted feeding works so well is because you're actually aligning with your clock genes more. And now I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that if you're sleeping well and your circadian rhythm is in rhythm, you're probably going to have a better time maintaining a healthy weight. And I think that that's been demonstrated in quite a few studies, that sleep is pretty darn important, whether it comes back down to your leptin, ghrelin, your hunger hormones and all of this, or literal things that make you store fat or not store fat, right? So if we get down to the nitty gritty of it, the early time restricted feeding group saw an improvement in their HOMA IR scores. Now, HOMA IR is a measurement for insulin resistance. It's sort of like a lagging indicator for a period of time to see how high insulin levels have been for X amount of time. So when you see a change that is decently significant in HOMA IR, you know that your fasting insulin levels have probably decreased. And we know from a previous 2018 study in the journal Cell Metabolism that Early time restricted feeding reduces not just fasting insulin levels, but also reduces postprandial insulin levels at 60 and 90 minutes after a meal. So when you look at collective data from other studies, you can start to connect the dots. Okay, then of course there's that increase in insulin sensitivity. That means that the cells were able to receive insulin and do the job they were supposed to do with it. There was the decrease in adipose tissue, which of course means a decrease in overall fat mass. There was a decrease in overall weight, of course, in ETRF compared to MTRF. Now don't get me wrong, midday time restricted feeding was still super, super effective. And I'll get down to the granular of how you can practice this and do it, and I've done other videos on it, but I just wanted to outline the results first. The other thing that I found very interesting was there was an improvement in gut microbiome diversity. Now I've done other videos on this, but a lot of the data is very ambiguous. And even with this particular study, the researchers, they had some hypothesis, but they didn't really know why. Essentially what's happening is when you fast, you have kind of a changing of the bacteria. Like some of the gram negative bacteria tend to die off and some of the gram positive bacteria tend to, tend to flourish. You just have a rebalancing. And when you have this happening, you can improve gut diversity. It's a tough one to really address because everybody's microbiome is so unbelievably different. So this study taking a look at 82 people was at least a large enough study to say, okay, if we're actually seeing positive changes, then maybe fasting is having some kind of correlation here. But again, the early time restricted feeding group seemed to have the best response and it may have to simply do with the fact that you're eating when you're supposed to eat, during the day, during daylight hours. Because I think I've seen some other studies, I don't recall exactly which ones, that when people are overeating at night, it alters their microbiome in a negative way as well. 
So with fasting and the microbiome, it's very important you're consuming enough fiber, which I talk about all the time. Supporting the microbiome diversity is one of the most important things that you can pay attention to because that's one of the most powerful links we have with all kinds of different things. I put a link down below for the probiotic that I recommend. It's called a Symbiotic. It's from a company called Seed. So you can save 15% on them if you want to try them out. They are a sponsor of this channel. They have been for a number of years, but they're really, really interesting because they have a cool technology with a capsule inside of a capsule. So you can kind of see the footage right now. Really interesting, so it has this like kind of multi-stage delivery of a prebiotic and a probiotic. So again, that link will save you 15% off if you use code THOMAS15. Again, you don't need a probiotic when you're fasting, but if you're putting extra effort into eating the right things, it might not be a bad idea to add in. So that link's down below. One of the biggest benefits that came out of the early time restricted feeding group was they had an enhanced rhythm when it came down to the circadian clock genes. What does an enhanced rhythm mean? You see, our body is always kind of on this circadian clock, and we have two different kinds of things that are affecting it. We have our own sort of endogenous clock that's just kind of occurring in our body, and then we have environmental cues, okay, daylight, uh, sun in general, eating food, nighttime, all these things that cue our body to do different things and hormonal and neurotransmitter cascades that come as a result. When we're bombarding our body with food, when we're not supposed to be eating, i.e. at night, you can see how that's a mix-up of these cues, right? So this study found that there was more expression of what is called BMAL, BMAL, and also PER1, P-E-R1. These are two of the most heavily researched circadian clock genes. And if we are not expressing these genes, we are not having a lot of these downstream signals that allow us to really get the benefits of, well, our circadian rhythm. So when we wake up, we should have genes that are expressed that are associated with being awake. That's why there's so much data out there that suggests we can handle food better in the morning. We can oxidize fats better in the morning. We can utilize fats better in the morning. We're more insulin sensitive in the morning. We have less propensity to store fat in the morning because every environmental cue is saying burn, 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 burn. So it makes sense that early time restricted feeding, consolidating the calories to the morning is largely better than even consolidating calories midday because every little bit of trickle over later in the day is adding or working against these circadian clock genes. The interesting thing is when you look at the ETRF group and the MTRF group, the caloric intake was just about the same. So ordinarily, I would pick apart a study and say, well, one consumed less calories or one consumed more calories or one had more activity. The ETRF group and the MTRF group were so similar in terms of calories and what they ate the researchers are really looking at this saying, well, these results are coming as a result of the time of day that they're eating and when their fasting period is, not so much the caloric intake. Because we're not measuring against typical caloric restriction. We're measuring navel oranges to little teeny tiny oranges, tangerines, right? It's like, we're not apples to oranges, we're measuring very similar things here, but with different timing systems. So what you can try to do is maybe just one day a week, try skipping dinner. There's some other evidence that suggests that it doesn't really take a whole lot. You can start reducing the amount of food you're eating in the afternoon, evening, and maybe one or two days a week, just skip dinner or have dinner by 4 p.m. Just be a senior citizen like me. I'm you know, in my 30s, but I act like I'm 70 when I have dinner by 5 p.m. Just try having your dinner a little bit earlier so that you have a chance to have your insulin levels come down overnight a little bit better, but you also give your body a chance to get that BMAL expression, to get that PER1 expression, and get all the benefits that we've been talking about. It doesn't take much. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.